Farmed Out, page 51. When Mom got pregnant, her belly swelled like bread dough rising. And when it came time to deliver the baby, everybody got sent to stay with relatives. Lainey went to Grandma and Aunt Mary's house in Arlington. Tommy and Bobby went to Grandma and Grandpa's house in Fall River. Jimmy and I got the best deal of all. We went to Uncle Paul and Aunt Louise's house in Rhode Island, and they had as many kids as we did. Aunt Louise was French-Canadian. Uncle Paul was Dad's oldest brother. He was an English professor. He'd sit around the house reading thick books and smoking a pipe, calmly ignoring the deafening racket made by all the kids running and yelling around him. Getting farmed out was terrific. Aunt Louise never made us clean dishes off the table or do any chores. We didn't even have to make our beds. For breakfast, she cooked fried eggs on toast sandwiches. They were so delicious I couldn't stop eating them. On warm days, we always went to the beach. In the late afternoon, we'd walk to Brooms, a store that sold nothing but penny candy. When it got dark, we ran through the neighborhood playing flashlight tag and hide and seek until the lawns turned cool and moist and bats began to appear in the sky. Aunt Louise dialed our number so Jimmy and I could talk to Mom and Dad. So you don't get homesick, she said. But honestly, I didn't really miss them. I felt a little guilty about that, but it was true. It seemed like I had shed my tight family skin for something bigger, looser, more comfortable, if only for a few days. Baby, page 55. Can we get a pet? Lainey asked. A kitten? A dog? Please? Every year we were posed the question. We begged. We pleaded. Yep, Mom and Dad always had the same answer. We've already got enough little animals running around here, they said. Goodness knows we don't need another. In our house, most of the action took place in the kitchen. Mom talking on the telephone, kids and friends eating popcorn or slurping watermelon or sucking popsicles and jabbering nonstop about the big table. The kitchen was the heart of our house and the baby's playpen stood in the center of the kitchen. I never got used to the calm, knowing look in Aaron, Karen Ehrenberg's eyes when she turned to ask, have you heard the scuttlebutt? But I sure had gotten used to babies because mom brought them home from the hospital regular as once a year holiday. The newest baby stayed close to mom for the first few months, nursing, sleeping a lot. We had a creaky white bassinet with wooden wheels so you could move it around the house. When the baby reached six months, it graduated into the playpen. And this meant that whoever had been in the playpen got released from the baby cage. Free! So it could stagger unsteadily around the house, pulling everything it could reach off shelves and tables, leaving a mess wherever it went. I loved the Fletcher baby, whoever it was, whatever its name. I loved the pudgy little body that gr gummy grins, the milky breath, the soft spot on the top of its head. I loved coming in from outside to see my big-eyed little creature in the playpen, drooling, yelling, cooing, laughing, fussing, peekabooing, its head swiveling this way and that, trying to follow all the antics of the big kids. Mom barely had a second to breathe, what with doing laundry, answering the phone, cooking supper, or nursing the new baby. So when the baby started crying, I helped out. We all did. I knew how to pick up the baby and tell if its diaper was dirty or clean by how spongy it was. I knew how to change a dirty diaper and avoid the messiest ones, how to pin the cloth diapers without poking the baby. I was good at telling the difference between I'm really hungry crying and I'm just bored fussing. I loved the taste of baby food and always sneaked a few bites when mom wasn't looking. I knew how to warm up a bottle of milk in a saucepan on the stove or squirt a little on my wrist to make sure the milk wasn't too hot. I could pick up the baby and walk around with it, cocking my right hip so the baby could have a nice little ledge to sit on while I held it snug with one hand and a rummaging through the cabinet for a teething biscuit with the other. While the eternal Fletcher baby sitting in the playpen year after year, I sort of became an expert on the subject. Bobby, page 59. Bobby was baby number five. He sat in the playpen happy as pie, like he had no idea what it was coming, which of course he didn't. How could he? How could any of us? Bobby seemed no different from the rest of us. He ate, slept, played, argued, laughed, watched TV, took baths, rode the school bus, complained about having to go to church, but he wasn't like the rest of us. Bobby never got a chance to grow up. In his last year of high school, he was killed in a car accident. When he was little, I remember walking into the kitchen and seeing his head through the slats in the playpen. The front of his shirt was soaked with drool, and Mom said he was cutting his first tooth. But he seemed content talking to himself as he turned the crank on his jack-in-the-box. I tried to sneak past, but Bobby saw me and made a loud sound, extending his little arms straight up into the air like, Touchdown! Which meant, pick me up. I'm a sucker for that move. No possible way I could ignore it. All right, hold your horses, hold your horses, I told him. 
Bending down, I grabbed him firmly under both armpits and made a happy gurgling sound, like a baby's idea of a song, as I lifted him so soft in his little body into my arms. He was a real good baby and a terrific brother. Not a day goes by that I don't miss him. Daily Life, age 9, page 61. We didn't live in a very big house. Mom and Dad had a bedroom downstairs. Lainey and the baby slept upstairs in a tiny bedroom. The other upstairs bedroom was a big, half-finished room with three sets of bunk beds. All the boys slept there. The bedroom was always a lively place with lots of hysterical laughter as two brothers made a sneak attack on, on one bunk bed or another. Two counterattacked with a barrage of stuffed animals thrown from one side of the room to the other. The bathroom was always far away, so Mom put an empty milk bottle in the middle of the room. At night, if any of us boys had to pee, instead of walking all the way to the bathroom, we'd pee into the bottle. That milk bottle was convenient, but it created a monumental mess if someone accidentally knocked it over, which happened more than once. My brothers and I loved to jump up and touch the wood above the doorways. Every few weeks, Mom had to climb up on a chair to clean off our fingerprints. When Mom went food shopping, she always filled two carts to the very top. We helped her lug the bags of food into the house, and then she started cooking dinner. One night, she served everybody, but by the time she finally sat down to eat, all of us had finished and were ready for dessert. Mom did not look amused. This is not going to work, she hissed slowly. The next night at supper, we started a new routine. All the kids had to wait, folding our hands, until she finally had the chance to sit down. After Dad said grace, we were all allowed to start eating. Ten minutes, Mom reminded us when the meal ended, and we knew what that meant. Everyone pitched in to clean up from supper. With so many hands working together, we could always make the kitchen look spotless in ten minutes or less. With such a big family, Mom and Dad created lots of rituals like that to keep the family running smoothly. But some of our rituals were a little odd, like when Mom motioned for us to, in the living room and told us to snick up the rug. Aw, Mom, Jimmy moaned, I want to go outside. Come on, she said, it won't take five minutes. At that word, snick, each one of us got down on all fours and started picking up tiny bits of dirt, dust, and lint from the rug. I grabbed a piece of dirt, tucked it neatly into my palm, and scooted forward to pick up some more. Everyone helped. Even the baby pitched in. With so many kids, plus mom, it didn't take long before the rug looked nice and clean again. The same ritual took place every night, and I never gave it a second thought. It's not as if we were poor. We had a TV and a car. We had a vacuum cleaner, too, but for some reason, we never used it. At the end of the day, instead, we snicked. And I figured that the same thing must be happening in every other house in town. Mothers and kids getting down on their hands and knees to snick up the rug before Dad got home from work.